Hey guys, today we're going to talk about something a little bit different. I've been on watching on Facebook and other social media, and I've actually seen a lot of my, a lot of people and a couple of close friends actually talk a lot about PTSD and uh, uh, suicide. It's a difficult subject to talk about, but I have a friend here, Kevin, Kevin Batts, that uh, he has a little personal experience with that, and I, I think it'd be good to hear it. How's it going, Kevin? It's going fantastic, and I'm so happy to be here in this awesome studio. This is uh, my second time doing this show, and I am so happy to be here again. I'm Kevin, and I am with Red River TV. Can you say that with more excitement? Red River TV. Try it with a smile. Can you see my excitement growing and building? Okay, this is a serious topic, but you know we're you know we're we're happy warriors. We're Christians. So we're not going to go in here solemn and downtrodden. So we just want to proclaim in the beginning that, you know, just because you deal with things does not make you a victim. We're not victims. Talking about your issues is not a victim thing. It's not something that makes you weak. It's something that actually makes you stronger. So we're going to go into this PTSD topic because I know that um, Joshua has been through a lot of different things and you know, we all have. So we're going to try to talk about the things that we've been through. So hopefully it'll help you talk about the things that you've been through down in the comments. So I guess starting off, I did 10 years in the military, um, active duty. I went to Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, I'll tell you the quick version of my PTSD story. When um, I was in Iraq, things were fantastic. You know, we, we built a lot of bases and stuff like that. That's what I did. I wasn't with an engineer company. And we built a lot of the bases that were over there. When I was in Iraq, we built large bases. When I was in Afghanistan, we built a lot of smaller bases. So this was, both of these missions were pre-surge. I don't know if you guys remember during the wars, there was like a time, I guess you can call it like a line of demarcation where um, they had a surge where like, we're finally going to deal with this evil scourge in this country and settle this war. And um, so they had a surge. And so we were there pre-surge for both of those, actually. I think that's probably a God thing that I ended up there both times because things weren't going well, you know, when we got there. So in our Af Afghanistan, you know, that was my second deployment. We got there in like a pre-surge type scenario as well. So we were building a lot of these smaller bases and, you know, it was a lot of troubles building those bases, you know, and I really won't go into too much detail, a lot of the troubles that we dealt with, but I'd say that, you know, it's the equivalent of having to fight your way in and having to fight your way out because you're not going to the best areas to build these things. And they don't want you there building these things. You have to go. And it's kind of like a parable of life where you're going somewhere and you have to build strongholds. God, God will do that to some of some of you where he'll bring you into areas where you need to build a stronghold. So you ever wonder why you end up somewhere and you're like, God, I'm around all these heathens and all these bad people. Why does God have me with all these people? That's what you're supposed to do. You're a warrior. You're on a deployment. You need to go out to the areas that are hot spots, and the enemy doesn't want you there. So he's going to be coming after you. So in in the in, in that action, you're going to get scarred up. You're going to get hit. You're going to have things that happen to you, and you're going to have to bring those things to God. But when you don't have God, you know you tend to hang on to certain things, and um, even sometimes when you do know God, you turn on to certain things, but you're not supposed to. You're supposed to overcome them. So when I was in Afghanistan, we, I dealt with a lot of things and got involved with a lot of situations that weren't the best. And it left me mentally scarred in a lot of ways. I didn't have any physical issues besides a few little minor things. Thank God. But anyway, so I get back from Afghanistan and my wife immediately knows that something's different about me. I seem like I'm angry all the time. I seem like I'm really introspective all the time. And I was, I was in my own head about a lot of things that went on. And I felt like I was a lot of survivors, guilt, suicide ideation, and things like that, just reliving those different ideas. And also being back in America, feeling like, you know, these people really didn't support me. Nobody was really there for me, you know, just pity, pity, pity. That thing will just get to you and just start eating at you every single day. And if you don't get a hold of it, it will take over your life. And that's what happened to me. So I started drinking and I started, you know, 
not wanting to deal with my wife, not wanting to deal with my issues. And it led to me starting, it started letting me, um, it led to me having um, blackouts where I'd be doing things and I would just black out and I would come to and I would be somewhere different and it'd be a whole different thing. And I'd have to deal with the aftermath of whatever happened while I was blacked out. And one day I was driving to work. Um, I was still in the military at the time and I was driving on base. I don't remember the drive. I just remember getting in my truck and I remember pulling into work. I don't remember anything else. And I didn't really think nothing of it because I was in my head, like I said before. So, um, so I get to work and I get a call from my CEO and he says, come to the, come to headquarters because the MPs are here and they want to talk to you about something that happened. And so I go to the headquarters and if you, you weren't in the military, that's like you, every, every element has a headquarters, you know, it's where the commander's at and everything else. So I went to the headquarters and the MPs were there and they're, they're questioning me they're like, Hey, did you have an accident on your way to work? Did you hit somebody? Did you do anything with your vehicle? Did you, you know, and I'm like, no, I, no, I don't, I don't remember the drive to work, you know, but I know I didn't do that. That sounds crazy. You know, we can go look at my truck if you want to find out if I did something. And so we all walk out to my truck and I'm just as sure as I can be that there's, there's nothing going to be there. We walk outside and guess what we find, Joshua? <laughs> I, I can guess. My truck is full of dents and I had a um, 1500 HD. If you guys don't know what that is, it's a pretty big size, big truck. It was the first year they made it. And it was like a three quarter ton, almost like a three quarter ton truck with a, um, with a gas engine in it. And so it was a big, pretty big truck. It's hunter green and it had, um, brush guard on the front and, you know, it had a, um, a headache rack in the back. And I mean, it was yeah. a really slick truck. It's awesome. But I mean, the thing was a tank and I look at it or walking around it and it had brush guards on it and stuff like that, side steps. And so uh, we're looking at it and it's just the freaking side steps are all dented in the freaking, um, the, the, um, the, 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 the grill, um, was all dented in and stuff like that. Like I had hit like multiple things. So they tell me the story and they're like, listen, we're going to place you under arrest because on your way to work, you clearly drove into this parking lot. People took pictures of your license plate. They watched you do it. You pulled wow. in. You smacked one car, then you backed up, hit another, then you went forward and hit another. So you just like on a crazy car attack or something in a parking lot full of people. And everyone was screaming at you, telling you to stop and you wouldn't stop. And I, for the life of me, I couldn't remember it. It just like just shattered my world. And so this is a culmination of when you have red flags in your life and you don't deal with those red flags and you feel like you can just handle it on your own. And that's what I was trying to do. And so what it culminated in was me finally having this happen. I get to, I get arrested. So I go down to the MP station. I spend about a half a day there. My commander sends one of the sergeants to come pick me up. He comes and picks me up and they all knew my character. So thank God for, um, favor. You know, I've always had favor with leaders that I had had in my life. So my leaders had favor, had favor with my leaders. So they trusted my story that I did not remember. Yeah. Thank goodness. Because ended up after that was like, Hey, you got to get some help. So I spent the, you know, at the beginning I tried counseling and stuff. I was like, I don't want to do, I want to get healed of this. I don't want to take medicine. Yeah. I don't want to be on medicine the rest of my life. I don't want to be a victim to this. I don't want to own this as something that that's a part of me. No, I want to get healed. So that's when I got closer with God and I started really just figuring out, my why and what God has me on this earth for. And that's when I had, I formed this new relationship with God and God ended up healing me of all those different things. And I haven't dealt with a lot of that stuff since, I mean, I still deal with anxiety, but about certain things, not as much anymore, but still dealing with a few things, but you know, God's going to heal me of those things. But as far as, um, you know, I almost lost my wife. I almost lost my family. You know, and that the enemy will try to rob you of your destiny. And he'll try to use things that are legitimate, things that happen, things that are real, real wrongs. He'll try to use that to rob you of your destiny. 
and it's your job to say no. It's just as easy to be a victim and say, well, these things happen, so now I get to be this way, and then you get to lose your destiny. But that's kind of my PTSD story. Um, Joshua. Yeah, mine's completely different. Nothing like oh, that. It's horrible. Um, it's but, a lot worse. Yeah, no, well, I don't like to compare because it, 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 it everything's bad. It's, yeah, it's relative. Yeah, everything's bad to that person. My, yeah. my wife complains, will complain about her back hurt. Then she looks at me and she says, oh, I know it doesn't hurt as bad as yours. I was like, listen. I was like, I've been conditioned for this. I've trained for this. I was yeah. like, your back hurt hurts just as bad as mine. That's kind of like how people like – people will be like from Alaska up north of Connecticut or something like that. Is you'll be like it's cold today, and they're like it ain't cold. And it's like, yeah. dude, can it be cold? Yeah, or does it like never be cold here because it gets way colder somewhere yeah. else? Like, exactly. Come on now, if we're gonna play this game, then I guess no one can be cold except people from Alaska. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's an annoyance of mine. Anyway, I uh, well, it's kind of you know a lot of people has thought, and I when I was younger, I thought PTSD was only for like military. Stuff yeah, like that, that's a but big misconception. and because they're they're the only ones that seem to be you know all the advertisements for counseling stuff PTSD it's yeah. it's geared towards military you know and a lot of people think that you become violent because of PTSD or you're going to, you you go on a rage or you start having flashbacks and that that's that's not the truth I mean it, it's true for somebody but mm -hmm. for for a good percentage of people it's not true mine uh you know a lot of people assumed it was because of um. People that know, which very few people know, but um, that it was law enforcement because, you know, I was a cop for 11 years, but it wasn't. Um, in fact, it didn't even affect me then. Um, it's uh, the way I grew up. You know, I, I, I've just, just glazed over it, said that I grew up in hell. But, I mean, my first father figure was my stepdad. And um, he also was the person who taught me how to fight in a war. Because he would, you know, I'm six years old. He hands me a, a, a rifle. It was probably, could have been an air rifle. It could have been a 22. I can't remember. I was five or six years old. And he'd have a slingshot. And then we'd go out. We lived in this uh, abandoned uh, uh, farmhouse with a, with a, that had a hayloft and a silo and everything that was some an fest. Ab an abandoned farmhouse? Ooh, yeah. An abandoned farmhouse? That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was covered in snakes. I mean, there, there were, when you walk into it, you would see at least four or five snakes just just by walking into it. Um, they were all over the place, and most of them were actually hidden within the within the hay itself. Um, but um, I would hide, and he y'all bandits or something? What the heck is this? What's going on? I I have no idea. They were uh, they um, uh, didn't really have jobs. You know, they oh, okay. we moved around a lot. Um, I, I've probably lived in 16, 17 different cities before I was 17. Mm. Um, but uh, anyways, he would, he would, um, he'd, we'd play hide and seek. He'd go find me. And when he found me, there was one time he found me and he, he, um, I found, saw that he found me because he hit me in this, with a slingshot in my ankle. And so I turned around and I shot him. I mean, and, and I hit him. You shot him with a gun? Yeah. With that, with that rifle. Um, what the heck? It, it didn't kill him or anything, but you know, it, it hurt. I mean, that's all I can remember. I don't, I don't have a lot of memory of growing up, but these things I do remember. But I mean, before I was, before I, I was even six years old, I dealt with, you know, murders, rape, you know, violence, you know, a lot of alcohol, drugs, stuff like that. Um, and you know, I remember one day, uh, my mother, she was, she never did anything to stop it. But she was very suicidal, very apathetic towards us. She wouldn't do anything. Was, she became a victim. And I remember waking up. It was right before my um, uh, stepdad went to prison. Um, and the um, I just saw the uh, police lights. And I walked out. And in the hallway, uh, I turned in the bathroom, and it was just covered in blood, you know, where she had tried to kill herself. Um and, you know, fast, he ended up kidnapping somebody and going to prison and stuff. And then my you'd think my mom, she escaped. Well, then she ends up with another guy that um, was was abusive towards her um, and even more abusive towards me, but not in that way. You know, it was more like, you know, fist to cuffs abusive. You know, I learned by the age of eight that I could take a punch, you know. Um, but I, I dealt with a lot of that trauma and stuff. And then uh, she abandoned us. Me, my brother, and sister in a, in a house in Texas, Arlington. 
and um, and of course, I'm trying to give a lot of information in a short yeah. amount of time. Yeah. yeah. But um, when we were in Texas, we lived in the ghetto, which, by the way, the only people that picked on me were other white guys. All the black people were nice to me and stuff. Uh, my my experience was that um, people people are just shitty. It doesn't matter about your color or anything. But um, she she left us in Arkansas or Arkansas. Um, I ended up moving to Arkansas after that. But she left us. Uh, she didn't tell us she was abandoning us or leaving. She just left us at the neighbor's house and never came back. How old were you when that happened? Eight years old. Um, yeah, well, I ended up moving with my granny and grandpa in Arkansas, but uh, I didn't know it. But my granny was dying of cancer. And so she ends up moving, uh, moving me and my sister in with my aunt and uncle. And uh, my aunt and uncle made it, they, they relatively, they were good people, middle class workers, upper middle class workers and stuff like that. They made decent money, but they let me know that I'm a guest in their house. You know, I was never accepted as being living there as that my, that was my house. So I ended up moving on my own when I was 17 and ended up living in a car and going to going to high school and having a full-time job. Well, I um uh none of that really bothered me, I thought. You know, there's a lot more other stuff that happened, but yeah, that's yeah. a long story. Um for later on in the years, but Fast forward to just a couple of years ago, you know, I'd never had anxiety or anything. Nothing ever bothered me. I, I was cool. That was what I was known for. Then one day I'm just sitting in my living room and my heart just starts racing. I mean, it just starts beating hard. Like I just got through running a marathon and then I had an adrenaline dump. You know what that was like chemicals in your body. Just you feel it. And then my, my body starts going numb, not the tingling numb. Like I literally did. Like it does. Yeah. And I thought I was dying. Not, not like, uh, Oh, I thought I was dying. I know. I literally thought that I was dying. I started hearing things in echo and all I could think of was my daughter, you know, and she started, she was wanting me to come over there and she kept on saying, daddy would mess with my head even more. And I mean, it, it was the scariest thing in my entire life. It, because I looked at my daughter and I was thinking she's going to grow up without a dad. You know, and it, it hit me hard. Um, but after about 30 minutes or an hour and stuff, things started calming down. I started getting better. But I found it happened several times. We ended up going to the ER thinking that I was having a stroke. And mm -hmm. they thought I was having a stroke. But all my tests, MRI, um, uh, EKG, everything came out great. Um, and then I found out that, well, it was, it was PTSD. They said that it definitely happens when everything seems fine. You know, it's in the calm moments. Otherwise, it's just anxiety or an anxiety attack. You know, it's when everything seems perfect. And, you know, I, I, I didn't know what to do because, you know, I finally, for the first of my life, I have, you know, a wife and a daughter. You know, I have family. I yeah. And it's then that this kind of, I mean, when I didn't have anything, when I spent most of, you know, the first 35 years of my life, alone wishing for death i wasn't suicidal i did not want to get killed i didn't want to kill myself but i was hoping i'd end up in a situation that i would die in the line of duty or something wow and now that i'm finally happy and wanting to live it, it hit like a ton of bricks and it was when i started started praying and and not reading my Bible. I'm, I'm, I, I have read the Bible since, but it wasn't like that. It's when I started talking to God, you know, and, and it just hit, um, own it. Yeah. Own who I am, own what I do. You know, people don't have to like me. People don't have to like, a lot of Christians don't like me because I'm not your front pew Bible thumping Christian. I don't care what your beliefs are. I'm not going to try to get you to believe what I believe. I just know that when you have a relationship with God, a personal relationship, that you literally can handle anything. You know, and and, and I get told I, I I got pushed away from from God most of my life because mm. Christians would they they cared about my soul, but I'm sitting there you know they're inviting me to church. I look like a cancer patient with two black eyes, <laughs> and they never asked me about my home life. 
they they'd send me back in hell, but they wanted me to say the magic words that would get me to heaven. You know, and and it just it just doesn't work. But it was acknowledging it and stuff, and it it made it easier because what I found out, you know, it's kind of like the reason why I started this podcast. I'd always said that if my story helps one person, just one person, either get through what they're going through or avoid what they're going through because of my story, not only was it worth it, I'd do it again. But how is anybody going to know that if I don't talk about it? Yeah, that's good. You know, and so it's that. It's that we all have something in our life that is that is pressuring us and we think oh we can't do this oh i'm i'm tired of being a victim i'm tired you know i'm tired of things going bad nothing's ever going right well that's the point it's going through that mm -hmm. i mean have you ever built a muscle without tearing it down first yeah, it's down. it's literal that's how everything in life works i used to you know when i was in martial arts i i, I was a brick breaker you know and you didn't start out breaking a brick you'd break your hand you know it wasn't just about, you know, the, the precision, and everything. It was training your, your bones. Anytime you punch something, you get these little fractures. And then it grows back harder and harder and harder. That's why them Kung Fu masters can break through anything. It's because their hands are that solid. That's the way we are. I like, I like how you juxtapose punching things in the face to uh, yeah. having, you know, your faith being strengthened. Yeah. But, you know, like I said before, we're warriors, you know, we're called to be warriors, you know, warriors for Christ. So this is a battle. And so you got to strengthen these things. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, people, people have got to recognize that, but you got to recognize yourself first, recognize the relationship with God and, and don't convolute it and try to get all religious and say, well, you got to, it's about reading your Bible. I'm not saying don't read your Bible. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not going to, I'm not saying that you can't look for it and find answers. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you're reading your Bible, you better be talking to God. You know, the relationship with God is more important than any kind of relationship because that's who you are. If you're, you are literally part of God. Did you know that if you were to put yourself under a microscope to the very smallest molecules, you were literally nothing but light and vibration? That's a scientific fact. That's called God. That's why we're made in God's image. So if you are helping somebody, you're worshiping God. If you're being good to somebody, you're worshiping God. You know, and, and that's also why God will put you in situations where you'll be in darkness because you're called to be that thing that disrupts that system wherever you're at. If you're called to be there. Yeah. 